Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Nick Creswell and I am Chair of the uh, UK and Ireland Chapter of Pride at Work, which is the Thomson Reuters Network for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Employees and also their friends in the organisation we care about creating as inclusive a workplace as possible. So we're really, really excited today to be, to be able to present uh, this uh, to presentation on gender identity. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to be handing over to uh, one of our co-executive sponsors, uh, Chris Perry, who's going to let you know a little bit more about this session. So, Chris, on that note, over to you. Great. Matthias, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to everyone around the world. My name is Chris Perry, and in our business responsibilities, I am uh, head of the Global Sales and Account Management Organization for Financial and Risk. I'm also, as a part of my duties that I take dearly, the co-executive sponsor, along with Jane Moran, of our pride organization around the world. And I'm very pleased this morning to just do a couple of minutes of opening remarks on this impressive uh, session. Um, so um, as Pride at Work is a very important network to us, and I think you will join me in believing that at Thomson Reuters, we're very fortunate to work in a company who takes very dearly the concept of diversity and inclusion. And um, this affinity group is, in fact, an example of where we demonstrate that intent. Now, we're not perfect, but I think we have a great deal of intent in making our workplace more progressive. Um, the program today uh, that's sponsored is really one that is a, a subject that I think is um, very important across a very broad spectrum of people. And I think we feel that gender identity and gender expression are rarely discussed, um, particularly in the business context. And today we have a very uh, good opportunity to, to hear and listen to this, what I'll call, less than understood subject matter. Um, I happen to have a friend who is working through this type of situation right now, and it is difficult. So the opportunity for us in our workplace to get informed and information about this I think is really important. Um, we've invited people from across TR, um, UK and Ireland, to participate in this, and um, customers and other companies who are interested in the subject because, again, we feel strongly that it's not a subject that people talk very much about and get the opportunity to learn from each other in this capacity. So we hope that this talk will improve the way that you are uh, aware of the subject and the way that you can personally deal with the subject or personally be helping others that you, that you know of. Um, it is an organization, Pride at Work, that is uh, focused on our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and friends um, uh, organization and those that are part of that, and this program is really helpful for it. So uh, without any further ado, I think what I'll do is turn it over to Carrie Ad. Hello. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, well... Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you and see you. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, welcome to this uh, little webcast um, about gender identity. We'll talk about gender expression as well. This is, um, this is absolutely a gender identity kind of 101, so don't worry if you don't know anything about this. We're going to cover the basics. Uh, this is really for everybody. <clears throat> My name's Carrie Adagustin. I'm a... Um, I'm a software engineer at Thomson Reuters, but I'm a volunteer slash member of Pride at Work. Now, Pride at Work is our, um, it's our employee network for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender staff, but also for um, um, allies, you know, our, our straight friends, and anybody who needs any kind of support or advice. So absolutely everybody is welcome to join our network, and absolutely everybody is uh, welcome to uh, this presentation and pick up what they're going to pick up. Um, if you have any questions during the session, then you can drop me a private uh, message in the chat, and um, I'll, pick those all, <coughs> excuse me, I'll pick all those up at the end. Um, and if we still have time at the end, then we can open up the call and, and anybody can speak up if there's anything they want to say. So, why, why are we talking about gender identity? Primarily, <coughs> one of the missions of private work is... Um, it's about uh, ed educating and raising awareness of the kinds of issues that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender staff face. So this is kind of in our DNA. This is a mission statement for us. But um, really, this, this session was triggered by the addition of uh, gender identity and gender expression in the Thomson Reuters Code of Business Conduct and Ethics. So uh, right now, our, our Code of Conduct says, 
any form of discrimination or harassment on the basis of, and there's a number of things in there, gender identity or expression, is a violation of this policy and will be treated as a disciplinary matter. So the business takes this very, very seriously. This is a serious form of discrimination and harassment if, you don't, if you're not sensitive to these things. And all Thomson Reuters staff have had to agree to this as, as part of you know, the deal of working here. However, most people that I asked about this didn't actually know what gender identity or gender expression meant. Um, even in the rehearsal for this yesterday, people said, I don't actually know what this means, so I'm really interested in, in this rehearsal. Um, <clears throat> so let's kick off then with an actual definition of... Uh, actually, no, first of all, let's just go through the agenda of this. I'm sorry, <clears throat> I've got a cold. So in this presentation, we're going to do the dictionary definitions of gender identity and gender expression. We're also going to explore how gender identity can manifest itself in ways that you're going to see and experience in the workplace and at home. And uh, my manager, Dave Pearson, who is um, a very strong ally of, of um, LGBT staff, will talk about ways that we can support um, gender identity in the workplace, but also not just gender identity, but, but the importance of supporting um, a diverse and inclusive workplace. So, what is gender identity and what is gender expression? Gender expression is the way uh, a person presents their gender to the world. It's the gender that you can see. It's the way you dress and the way you act. So, for example, uh, a man might choose to express his gender by uh, growing a moustache, shaving his head, because those are the kinds of stereotypical ways that our society might expect a man to present himself. Um, if you present as a, as a woman, then you might grow your hair long and you might wear uh, a dress. Um, this is the way um, society determines that the that, that genders present themselves. Um, on the flip side of that, you have gender identity, which uh, nobody can see. It's, it, it's private to you. It's your own personal experience of how you feel your gender is. Um, Nobody can, can look at a person and assume what their gender identity is. And also, everybody has a gender identity. Uh, you, you, this isn't something that just you know, LGBT staff have. Everybody has a gender identity. You might not think of it that much. It might not be obvious to you, but it's something that everybody has. <clears throat> um, we can see how uh, gender identity and gender expression um, interact. We've got this little diagram here that I found online. This is the genderbred person. Um, it was taken from a website called uh, it's uh, <clears throat> it's pronounced metrosexual.com, and the diagram was drawn up by Sam Killerman. The the diagram kind of shows how gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, and biological sex manifest within a person, but we can also see how they're disconnected. You can see how gender expression um, isn't related to or, de or determined or, or, um, uh, or, or determined by your biological sex or by your sexual orientation. And that's, it's important to notice that there is a, a distinction there that these things are disconnected. Our code of conduct says that we protect all forms of gender expression and gender identity. We don't say uh, we, um, we protect your gender expression um, we, we, we protect you expressing yourself as female as long as your biological sex is female, or we protect you expressing yourself as male as long as your biological sex is male. We don't say that. We protect all forms of gender expression completely regardless of what your biological sex is. Um, so, for, for, for most people, they don't see a difference between gender expression and gender identity. There is uh, an assumption that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, for everybody, they're going to be the same thing. You know, if you're physically male, you're going to think that you're male in your head and you want to express yourself as male. But this isn't always the case. Um, there's Chris there. <laughs> um, it's possible, uh, for in a lot of cases, where uh, biological sex and the gender identity that you, that you feel, your private 
experience of your gender are not always congruent. And this can cause degrees of what's called, sometimes it's called gender dysphoria, sometimes it's called gender identity disorder. And um, it's, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable state of being to have that kind of discord, you know, within your mind and body. Um, and depending on the degree that people feel this disconnect between their biological sex and their gender identity, some people will choose to alter their gender expression. And some people will choose to alter their gender expression um, in the evenings or at weekends, maybe not, not in the office. They may choose to, to dress appropriately to how their gender identity feels. Uh, some people will feel it much more acutely. And some people will seek a medical transition of their, of their sex to match their gender identity. Um, and all of these people that have this discord between the, the, their biological sex and their gender identity may come under the transgender umbrella. Now, transgender is a, it's a, it's a big term that covers a lot of ways that people can manifest being between genders. So we might have cross-dressers who um, only alter their gender expression occasionally or, or a lot of the time. And it also covers transsexuals who who are changing their biological sex to match their gender identity. And for the sake of completion, we have these people who are transgender who don't, who, who, sorry, who do feel this discord. The opposite of transgender and the people who do feel that their biological sex and their identity and their expression all match, these people are cisgender. So you have trans, which is going between genders, and you have cis, which is the same gender. <clears throat> There's another assumption, which is there are only two gender identities. You have, uh, you have male and you have female, and the, what else could there be? You know, you see in the street, you see males and females. Uh, but it's, it's slightly more complicated than that. Let's, let's, uh, let's play for a second and assume that there is more than just a switch. On one side you have male, on the other side you have female. And let's, uh, let's allow a gradient between the two. So let's say on this scale, anyone who says that there are one means I'm 100% male in my gender identity, the way I feel about my gender. Two would be I'm primarily male, but maybe there's a bit of femininity to, to the way I feel about myself. Go along the scale to seven where you feel 100% I'm only female and I have no masculine traits at all. A lot of people might assume that you only see ones and you only see sevens if you were to ask people in the street or ask people in your office. But surprisingly, um, you, might, yeah, you might see most people say one or seven, but a lot of people will say, I do feel primarily male, but I have feminine traits. Or some people would say, I feel primarily female, but I know that I have a masculine side. In a lot of cases, you'll see a curve preferring the sides of the spectrum but by far not everybody would say, I am 100% this or 100% that. And in, in some cases, you'll see an equal distribution. Um, last week, um, uh, we at Pride at Work went to the Out and Equal Conference in Baltimore, and we actually performed this experiment. And it's a completely um, anonymous, it's a very safe environment where people could answer honestly. And in a room of 25 to 30 people, all answering this question honestly, where, where does my gender identity fit onto this scale? We did see an equal distribution. But that scale still isn't the whole story. Because you might be 100% male, but maybe you don't feel it as intensely as someone else. So we could, rather than thinking of one scale from male to female, we could have two scales, and you could feel intensities of maleness and intensities of femaleness. This still covers the examples that everybody's familiar with. So if I feel more female than male, so if my female scale is up at the top, but my male scale is right down at the bottom, then I'm considered a woman. Or if my male scale is right up at the top, but my female scale is down at the bottom, then um, I consider myself a man. But we have people who don't fit those binaries? What if someone considers, considers themselves equally male and female at the same time? <clears throat> it happens, and these people call themselves genderqueer. 
And it might not be uh, theirs equal male or female. Sometimes it's slightly above, slightly below. Uh, you, it's, you know, how do you quantify these things? You can't. Um, but people who generally feel that they have equal amounts of male and female, sometimes they call themselves genderqueer, and sometimes they call themselves two-spirit, uh, because they consider to themselves to have equally uh, a male spirit and a female spirit uh, within them. <clears throat> there are people who sometimes feel more male, so their scales up there, and sometimes they feel more female. This could change day by day, week by week. Um, it's a very, very personal experience. These people would consider themselves gender fluid. <clears throat> and a final example would be people who feel neither male nor female. So we still have the male scale and the female scale, but the intensity is way, way down at the bottom. And these people would call themselves genderless or gender neutral. And remember, this is completely regardless of biological sex. See if your own gender. And these are genuine, genuine examples. Um, how common are these examples? Well, we can actually look at the results of the 2001 United Kingdom census because the results have been uh, made public. And in 2001, approximately 14,000 people identified as both male and female. Actually, it's probably worth saying at this point that the way the census um, phrased this question, you had two tick boxes. There was a male box and a female box. And it was a legally mandatory question. You, you had to answer this one. And 14,000 people felt that the, the best way they could answer this question was to tick both. We also had 185,000 people who identified as uh, neither male nor female. Uh, they, they ticked neither box. And, and the people who answered the questions like this, um, it's, it's, a, it's very serious. It's a very personal experience. You don't want to hide who you are. You don't want to um, say, well, it doesn't matter, I'll just tick any box and just get this form done. So people did uh, interrogate the Census Bureau and ask them the question, you know, I feel um, I have a, a non-binary gender identity. What's the best way for me to answer this question? And these people were informed that they would not be prosecuted for failing to answer this legally mandatory question if they left it blank, if they ticked both boxes, or if they wrote an answer next to it. And whenever, whenever you can with these things, you know, if, if you're asking someone's gender online or in a form, if you... If you have just the options, you know, male, female, or, or other, it's, it's a great thing if next to the other you have a box or the ability for people to, to write in how they identify themselves. You might be really surprised at the kinds of ways that people identify themselves if up until this point you've never asked and just said you have to be male or female. And it's also worth pointing out that the results of the census and, and this quote here is taken from a website, practicalandrogeny.com. I'll, I'll share the URL again later, but this is a fantastic resource for learning a lot more about this stuff in a much deeper way than, than I'm going to in this session. <clears throat> okay. So, if you have a friend or family or colleague um, who identifies as one of these non-binary genders, What's the best way to refer to them? Because we're so used to saying, you know, his stuff, her stuff, give it to him, give it to her. Uh, but this, this is insensitive. This is insensitive because these people are not male or female. They are between male or female. They're off the scale. You can't say, you know, where they're going to be. Um, and don't forget that if you're going to be using language which isn't sensitive to, to someone's identity, and, and if, they, if, they, if they correct you and, and you continue to use insensitive language, then that's harassment. And this is covered by uh, the Thompson Reuters Code of Conduct, so you do absolutely have to be aware of this. Um, it's, it sounds unusual when you first start using it, but uh, using they to refer to someone as a singular, it sounds very strange, but it's, it's accepted and it's very commonly used. So rather than saying, you know, I passed Nat, his book, I passed Nat, her book, if you say I passed Nat, their book, it's, it sounds strange, but it's completely accepted and, and, and that's the way to go. But if you're in doubt, um, just use someone's name. Just, just, just say, just say uh, Nat or Carrie or, or, or whatever. You know, don't, don't try to overcomplicate um, a sentence. But it's so important to say that you, you are always, always welcome to ask questions. Nobody 
uh, the, noted that I know minds being asked questions. It's okay to not know this stuff, but it's okay to not have any experience. Um, as long as you ask questions, you know, with respect and with tact. So don't, in the middle of a crowded room, start asking people these questions. If you have the opportunity to um, to ask these questions discreetly about how people prefer to be referred to, absolutely ask the question. Find out what that person prefers rather than guessing, and and you'll go a long way. <clears throat> so as well as pronouns, we we can think about uh, these people's titles. Um, if you say Mister then you're presuming that, that they're a male. If you say Mrs. or Miss, you're presuming they're a female. And again, this is just as insensitive because you're still assigning a male or female label to someone who doesn't relate to that. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not so common in the United Kingdom, but some people have no title. It can be very difficult to do that because so many organizations of people assume there's a title and you have to pick one. But there's a growing trend for people to have no title at all to not imply uh, any kind of gender. But there's, there's a, a relatively new title is now accepted in the United Kingdom called um, it, it's MX, it's pronounced mix, and that's a completely gender neutral title. So anybody, uh, you, you don't have to identify as, as a non-binary uh, gender person. Anybody can can get a deep poll and say, I want my title to be. MX now because I don't want um, my name to imply uh, any form of gender because that's how I feel most comfortable. <clears throat> so those are the facts as I see them. Now I want to pass over to uh, my manager Dave Pearson who has been incredibly supportive in my in my team in my office of all forms of, uh, of diversity and inclusion, and I think it's great to hear his point of view. So, here we go. Well, thank you, Carrie. I've been, must admit, I've been totally absorbed with what you're saying. I've learned a lot again. Um, I'm not really thinking about what I was going to say, but probably the first thing to say is that I'm not an expert in any of this. Um, I don't particularly feel qualified. In fact, I feel underqualified to, um, to pass on any knowledge, really. All I can do is pass on my experiences. Um, and things that have worked well or haven't worked well and, and situations I found myself in maybe. Um, one thing probably worth pointing out, to me it just it didn't make sense. It, it doesn't occur to me to think of anybody differently based on their sex, their gender, their religion, their um, gender expression, all these things. So some ways you might think that makes it easy. Um, the problem is I probably was a little naive to think that everyone else felt like that and um, I think you'll find in your day-to-day -day life that some people aren't as open as you so it is something that you've got to look out for and manage. Um, right, well as a manager I also <laughs> couldn't understand why anybody would um, find any reason to reduce their pool of potential talent when building a team. You know, diversity does matter. It's the only way you can guarantee of having the biggest pot of talent to pick your best people from. Uh, and, you know, from personal experience, Carrie, that you've met, you know, she's one of the stars in my team in the organization. <laughs> and I wouldn't have been an idiot, really, if I'd let any kind of uh, gender aspects get in the way of that uh, and in her development. So. Uh, yeah, that's from a personal side. But Thomson Reuters, well, I think it's very nice to work in a company that is so uh, clear on its direction. Uh, it's got an incredibly clear directive. Uh, I think Carrie's shown you the, uh, the Code of Business Conduct and Ethics. Um, and I think through this and through the people that work in Thomson Reuters, you know, my management, human resources, I've always felt incredibly supported. Um, whenever I've had a question, um, you know, I have been able to go and ask that question. You know, examples might be something like, um, well, situations where somebody is struggling with um, gender identity or maybe even transitioning gender. You know, that kind of stuff, it's very clear from the company's point of view that it's a medical situation. So it's treated like any other medical situation. So it's very easy to, um, to work in that environment where you know you've got the support of the company. Um, now I've had to rethink this bit of it because after Carrie's uh, educated me so well 
um, thinking about gender expression and gender identity. Uh, they both exist in the code of business. <coughs> and I was just trying to think about how they actually affect my day-to-day -day work on management. And I think, and this is a personal view, I would say the gender expression, yeah, as Carrie said, that's what you see. That's how you present yourself to the world. And I would say it's the gender expression that you know, the team or the organization, if there are going to be problems, that's going to be the things they'll have problems with because that's what they're exposed to. So as a manager, and more importantly as a human being, I would say it's about making sure that those individuals don't feel threatened, don't feel bullied, don't feel uncomfortable um, by things happening in the workplace in relation to this. And, and yeah, the important thing is to act on it. I'm not saying you've got to be very heavy-handed. You've just got to point out that it's not acceptable. Um, and point it out publicly. I think if, uh, if everybody else hears your views, hears that it's not acceptable, then they're less likely to do it and, and to consider it and, and not think that um, it's okay because that's what everybody does kind of thing. So. Um, I also, um, quite importantly, thought it was important to have somebody else fight in the corner. I didn't want, um, in Carrie's situation, for instance, where she changed her name, I didn't want Carrie to be the one that thought she always had to correct people. Okay, so if, if I heard the wrong name, I'd say, hey, that's you know, not Carrie's name. And, um, and I think that's quite important. You don't want to feel isolated. I mean, gosh, you've got enough to put up with. So I think gender expression covers the team and the... Um, and the work environment and the people around you. Gender identity, probably, well, as Carrie said, it's what you feel inside. And, and I can see how that can really affect your well-being. You know, basically, you've got this, uh, this discourse, this turmoil between what you are expressing and what you're actually feeling inside. Um, and if your well-being is being affected, if you're not happy in your work, then obviously that's an issue for that person. They're not happy. That's a big enough deal. From a management point of view, if you're not happy, you're not productive. You're not able to perform well. So from a business point of view, that's another incentive to get this right. Um, I can only imagine the effort it takes to, um, to continually present yourself in a way that you don't actually feel that way inside. So uh, I think anything you can do as a... Um, you don't have to be a manager. Anything you can do as a friend, as a colleague, to help somebody not feel that that is something they have to struggle with, then uh, that's got to be a, a very good thing. Um, so that's more the pastoral care side of management, I would say. So it was quite nice hearing this presentation to finally get right in my head about the difference between expression and identity. Um, so what kind of things have I maybe done that um, people have appreciated or thought I've done okay and I suppose the the top level things are <coughs> that I've not been judgmental um, I've basically listened I've understood and I've tried to understand I've not offered opinions I've yeah unless I'm asked for opinions um, but when I asked I'm when I am asked something if I don't know the answer to that then you know I will find out I'll go to people and I'll find out and let's face it, some of these things, if you've never been exposed to them before, can be embarrassing. And bottom line is you've just got to, you know, bite it, get over the embarrassment, go and ask the question. And if you don't know the answer, you're going to have to find out the answer. So uh, just do it. And there are lots of people around that can help you. And I'll, uh, uh, well, the uh, Pride at Work yep. group on the Hub is probably the, the best place to go from within Thomson Reuters. <coughs> um, obviously, there's a lot of people on there. You can ask questions openly, or you can, uh, you know, you can private message, direct message individuals, and, and ask questions that way. Um, I guess the other thing was just knowing that I was there and I was supportive. I wasn't gonna, um, you know, cast judgment on it. I was, I was gonna listen and, and you know, make changes where changes needed to happen. Having said all that, that all sounds very rosy, but uh, you can't expect to get everything right every time. I certainly don't. Um, and you can't expect to know everything. Um, there are lots of situations that will come up. 
um, that are challenging. Um, that's what life and work is about, really. So I don't think you should treat them any differently to any other challenge. Um, something as as simple as changing your name may seem like, you know, <coughs> Carrie's described here in, in the description about um, using the terms his and her and so on. You know, in a change in the gender situation, particularly if you've known that person for a long time prior to them changing gender, it's an incredibly difficult habit to break. Um, and I think anybody that, well, everybody tries, let's face it. When you get it wrong, I think the only, the only thing I can suggest, suggest is correct yourself. If you don't correct yourself, somebody else should correct you because there's no point sitting there saying, oh, I got that wrong, maybe I'll just uh, keep quiet, maybe nobody noticed because by <laughs> correcting yourself... That's the worst. When people, yeah. when people assume that you're not going to notice the mistake, yeah. that's the worst thing. Definitely, I would agree with that. <laughs> and by correcting yourself, by doing it, you're actually learning by repetition, so yeah. it becomes second nature. Um, I think people that get it wrong, myself included, you know, you're embarrassed, you're upset that you've done it, so you will work hard to uh, to get it right. Uh, I think I'm almost the end of probably what I uh, planned to say, so I think summing it up, from my point of view, diversity matters. Uh, it's the best way to ensure you've got the, the best range of talent for your team, for your company. Um, the other side of it is that there is a learning curve. You're not going to know everything. Uh, you're not going to know everything you think you should. Um, and it's okay to ask questions in those situations where you you don't know the answers and just don't be embarrassed about it. Just go out and ask the questions. There are resources there, obviously. Uh, Pride, at, Pride at Work, the group on the hub, as I've said, it's a great place to go. Um, but one thing to do bear in mind is even no matter how you feel about it, bear in mind that others on your team, in your organization, they may struggle with it more than you do. So you're going to have to help them along as well. I think that's probably everything okay. I'm going to say, Carrie. I'll hand back to Carrie. Okay, thanks, Dave. That was... Uh, wow, I'm really lucky to have a manager like that. <laughs> Great. Okay, so now we can move on to answering any questions that anybody has. Uh, while we're answering questions, you can make a note of my email address if you want to get in touch. And the two websites that I, I mentioned, um, it's pronounced metrosexual.com has a copy of the, the genderbred person. And actually, the, the genderbred person that I used in the slides is only a very small part of the whole diagram. The, the, the rest of it that, you, that I didn't include has got some great examples about the, um, kind of the, the scales of maleness and femaleness and how people identify at different points in those scales. <clears throat> and practicalandrogeny.com is a great all-round resource for um, uh, all this stuff about non-binary gender. And it's got news and it's got kind of best practices a great place to visit. And if you are inside Thomson Reuters, then you can join the private work group. There's the URL there. And, you know, I, I can't stress this enough. Everybody can join our network. Everybody should join our network. It's not just for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender staff. It's for everybody who wants to support their colleagues, support their friends, support their family, um, support the business, and uh, learn about this stuff, ask questions. It, it, it's amazing. Everybody should join this. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions have come in on the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> so someone says, um, you mentioned it's okay to ask questions, but what's the best questions that people have asked? And are there any examples of... Inappropriate questions is, is the interesting one. Um, if you, um, it's it's almost like there are there are no inappropriate questions, but there are inappropriate ways to ask questions. Um, you know, there are questions which um, make me feel uncomfortable. You know, the people who want to ask very personal questions about my medical transition, or people who ask questions that I just don't want to answer, like you know, what was your name before you transitioned, things like that. Um, those are questions that are going to make people feel uncomfortable. Um, but maybe the best thing you can do is to explain to someone why it's an inappropriate question rather than refusing to, to answer it. Um, and, and the best questions that people have asked have been 
questions which um, they wish they've been embarrassed to ask, but questions which have affected the way they work with me. So people have said, um, uh, you know, people have asked, what's the best way for me to for me to uh, refer to you? What do you prefer? Um, people have asked questions about. Um, uh, well, they wanted people who wanted to understand medical transition better. Those have been good questions to ask because the more people know, the less mysterious and, and taboo it sounds. I can um, probably <coughs> put a through a few. Yeah, very go for it. Yeah, go I for think it. there are there are certainly <coughs> the very practical <coughs> questions. You know, change in gender. One obvious question that people is, well, which toilets are you going to use? Mm. And yeah, you know, when you think about it, it's really no big deal, and it's no. It's one of these things where there's really nothing to think about. You know, your gender is, let's say, your your gender is female. You'll use the female toilet. If your gender is male, you use the male toilet. Uh, Are you talking about gender identity or gender expression? Well, that's a very good question. Yes, <laughs> uh, it is identity at the end of the day, isn't it? It's how you are inside. You know, this is the the, the gender that you have. Um, the feel for that, I don't know the words to use really, mm -hmm. but the, the way you feel inside it, the gender that you've got. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> and I guess there are also um, the situations where people feel, right, okay, you've said, feel free to ask me questions. Yep. And then they start asking you questions. And at what point do those questions then suddenly go into asking very personal questions that you wouldn't ask your best friend sort of <laughs> questions, you know what yep. I mean? Yes. So, uh, but then that also depends on the on the person. There, there are people who are in my exact same situation who um, would not feel comfortable asking, answering the same questions that I do. Hmm. And I've got friends who would be happy to go much further. So I, I can't speak for all people and right. say, where to draw the line? All I can say is, when you're asking the questions, treat people as human beings and yeah. just be respectful. That's right. But, but, but don't take that as, I shouldn't ask questions. You should always take the first step and ask a question and go further if you if you need to. That's good. Okay, let me think. We've got another question here is um, what's the most useful resource to find out more about this stuff? Um, well I would say if you work for Thompson Reuters, then join private work. You can uh, you can post questions and you'll get answers from all over the world from all kinds of points of view. Um, if you're outside of Tolson Reuters, then if you just do a Google search for gender identity or gender expression, you'll find a lot of stuff. Uh, the two websites I recommend most are, are listed there on that slide, but there is so much online that you can that you can read about. So many different opinions, so many blogs, there are people on Twitter and, and all kinds of places. Um, but again, if you want to drop me an email, you are always welcome to, and I'll answer any questions the best I can. So that's the end of the questions that got sent in through chat. So um, we can we can open up the calls now. So if anyone wants to ask a question themselves, they're very welcome to. Um, I'm not sure if I can unmute the lines, but if anyone else can, there we go. Does anybody have a question they want to ask, or maybe want clarification on something? Um, well, I can't hear any questions. Can it, can it all see me okay on the webcam? Can anybody say anything at all? <laughs> yeah, we can see you. Okay, can hear you. We do. Another question's come in, which is how long has it taken for things to get better in the workplace for me? <clears throat> um, well, I can't speak for everybody. I can't speak for all officers. Um, I would say that there was there was a curve. Uh, there was a curve of acceptance and understanding. Uh, when I started transition, it was it was months. It was a matter of months before things really settled down. Uh, but but even years later, people have done it for a long time. They still um, they still make mistakes, and as long as you correct them, that's okay. Um, but even years later, it's still ongoing. But things got things that get better very quickly. It's still a great office to, you know, to work in. It's still a great atmosphere. Um, 
So it took months. That's going to be my answer. It took, it took months from, from people knowing nothing to people being accepting. So, um, one, more, one more call for questions. Anybody on the line want to say anything? Okay, well, there are no more questions. So, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for turning up. It's been a great session. Um, this was recorded, so the recording will be available to everybody that's here. You can go share it around to your friends. Um, don't forget, drop me an email if you want to know anything more. Join Private Work if you can. And thanks a lot. Bye-bye.